Hello, I'm not Chuck. Recently I was doing some exploring along the Natchez Trace Parkway near the border between northeast Mississippi and northwest Alabama. I was interested in two places marked on this map, Buzzard Roost Spring and Colbert Ferry. I had previously been to Colbert Ferry a few times, and I knew it was named for the man who built it, a man named Colbert. Then I read that Buzzard Roost Spring was also run by a man named Colbert, and I assumed it was the same man. But then I learned that Buzzard Roost Spring was the property of Levi Colbert, and Colbert Ferry was owned by George Colbert, Levi's younger brother. When I realized that both locations were in Colbert County, Alabama, and that the county was named for the brothers, that really piqued my interest. So I decided to do a little internet research on the Colbert family. When I googled Colbert, guess who popped up? That's right, Stephen Colbert. I knew who he was, but I didn't really know much more than that he was a television personality. On a whim, I did some reading and quickly learned that he had grown up pronouncing his last name as Colbert, which sounded a lot like Colbert. I began to wonder if there was a connection between Stephen and the brothers Levi and George. The more I learned, the more I wondered, do these men share a bloodline? At the end of the video, I'll tell you the connections that I found, but first let me give you a tour of Buzzard Roost Spring and Colbert Ferry. We, that is, you and I, are on the road today. We're traveling west on U.S. Highway 72 in the northwest corner of the state of Alabama. We're headed toward Mississippi. Notice that the GPS shows we're on a county road, and that's sort of correct because for a few miles, Highway 72 and County Road 10 are one and the same. This left turn puts us on a ramp toward the Natchez Trace Parkway but we're actually going to make a stop before we even get on the trace. As you can see, the name of the stop is Buzzard Roost Spring. How's that for a memorable name? It's one of many optional places that a traveler can visit along the 444 miles between Natchez, Mississippi and close to Nashville, Tennessee. By the way, at 444 miles, the Natchez Trace Parkway is the second longest national park in the United States. I'll let you think about what the longest one is. Buzzard Roost Spring is the location of the stand which is another word for an inn or a hotel that belonged to Levi Colbert. I'll tell you more about the Colberts in just a minute. First I want to ask you, you know the term one night stand? Have you ever wondered where that term came from? Well, here it is. A one night stand back in the early 18th century was a stand or an inn that was only worth one night stay. You didn't want to stay there a second night. Here's a picture of Levi Colbert. The first thing you notice about him is his stylish hairline which, personally, I'm very fond of. Levi was the second son of James Logan Colbert and his second wife, a Chickasaw woman, which made Levi half white and half Chickasaw. He was born in 1759 or so and died in 1834 right here at Buzzard Roost, although he primarily liked to live southwest of here near Cotton Gin Point in Mississippi. Levi was probably the most powerful and successful member of the Colbert family in both white and Native American society. In fact, he was made chief of the entire Chickasaw Nation in Mississippi while he was still a teenager. His Chickasaw name was Etawamba Mingo. 
Levi served under Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans and attained the rank of major. Although he was a busy man, he found time to father at least 25 children with the three wives he was known to have had. Levi Colbert's stand, or inn, was very well thought of because of the good food and accommodations provided. The nearby spring water was a refreshing treat for thirsty travelers. Let's go take a look at the spring. Levi was heavily influenced by his father, James Logan Colbert, so it might be a good idea to talk for a minute about him. He was most likely born in South Carolina somewhere around 1720 or 1722. The date's not clear. He came to northwest Alabama and northeast Mississippi when he was about 20 years old, and when he got here, he was enthralled by the beauty of the Chickasaw women that he saw. In fact, he married three of them who gave him a total of nine children, seven sons and two daughters. He became very rich, partly through trading and partly through piracy. He claimed to own large tracts of land and at least one fine house and 150 slaves. Colbert's second wife was the mother of four of his sons, Levi, George, Samuel, and Joseph. He raised all his sons to know both the white man's ways and the ways of the Chickasaw. All of his children spoke both languages fluently, and they were successful, Levi and George especially so. Speaking of George, let's go get on the trace and head north. This is mile marker 320. And we're only going to mile marker 327, so it'll be a pretty short drive. Watch the GPS as we make the left turn and get underway. We'll cross two bridges very shortly. The first bridge is a bridge over the access ramp we just left, and the second is a bridge over US 72. The speed limit on the entire Natchez Trace Parkway tops out at 50 miles per hour, and the road is patrolled by park rangers who will give a ticket for excessive speed. There are also signs stating that commercial hauling is not allowed, so we shouldn't see any 18-wheelers or gravel trucks. Generally, the traffic is pretty light during the week and not bad on the weekends. I love the gas mileage I get at 50 miles an hour. The parkway is quite long but not very wide, so it sometimes passes through farmland. There's lots of that here in northwest Alabama. Of course, the fields are really small compared to those in the Midwest and the western states. These are hay fields which have been cut and the hay has been baled. Here we have two more crops that are common in this area. I'm sure you recognize on the left is corn, but you may not be familiar with soybeans in the field on the right. Both of these are used in the preparation of mixed feeds for all kinds of livestock. Some of you will be glad to know this is the last crop we'll look at today. Do you recognize it? Here's a hint. It's not edible by man nor beast. Well, if you said cotton, you are correct. And here we are at mile marker 327. As you see, it's the exit for a place called Colbert Ferry. But I'll tell you a secret. There's no ferry within 100 miles of here. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, you need to know a bit about Levi Colbert's younger brother, George. George Colbert was the third son of James Logan Colbert, and his second Chickasaw wife, which made George half white, half Chickasaw, 
and a full brother to Levi. George was born in 1764 and died in 1839 all the way out in Fort Towson, Oklahoma, two years after moving away from his beloved home right here on the southern bank of the Tennessee River. George was probably the most well-known, the best-looking, and certainly the smoothest talking of all of James Logan Colbert's sons. He was made chief of the entire Chickasaw Nation in Mississippi upon the death of his brother Levi. His Chickasaw name was Tute Mastube. He served under Andrew Jackson in the Seminole Wars and was assigned the rank of colonel. George had one adopted son and fathered seven or eight children with his two Cherokee wives. This sign relates the story of how George charged Andrew Jackson $75,000 to ferry the general and his army across the river. However, the sign leaves out a few facts and figures. First, the army consisted of about 5,000 men, so a little arithmetic shows us that the charge per soldier was $15. Add in the horses, wagons, artillery pieces, ammunition, and other supplies, and the price per man seems less egregious. But history tells us that the everyday fare for a man on foot was 50 cents, and for a man on horseback was $1. So even if the effective price per soldier was only $10, it was quite high for that historical period. It's worth noting, however, that even though Jackson ultimately agreed to the $75,000, all Colbert ever was paid was a few hundred dollars. Let's walk a short way along the old trace to the clearing where Colbert's stand was. Walking along a path that has been used for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, triggers my imagination. I can visualize Native Americans carrying their bows and spears, Cane Tuck rivermen returning from the port of New Orleans, and soldiers traveling to battlegrounds near and far. I can understand how grateful they might have been to come upon one of the many stands along the trace where they could rest, drink their fill of cool water, and perhaps enjoy a hot meal. And I wonder if I could have survived in their situation. And sometimes I wish that I had had the chance to try. This is the spot where George Colbert's stand was located. After a venison supper, one guest here reported spending the night in an outbuilding with not less than 50 Indians. And every night, travelers along the trace were experiencing similar situations at one of the many stands along the way. Our final stop along the trace is on the southern shore of the Tennessee River. Let's get going. This is close to the place where George Colbert's ferry docked to unload and load passengers and cargo who wanted to take the safe way across the Tennessee River. I say close to the place because the river is much wider and deeper today than it was in the 1800s and so the original ferry dock is now completely submerged. The actual ferry was built by the U.S. government so it likely was well designed and well constructed and large enough to carry livestock and wagons in addition to the passengers. Propulsion across the river was provided by strong, brave men, probably Chickasaws and some Cherokees, with push poles, and they sometimes made several trips across and back in a single day. Once steamboats were built that could travel upstream on the Mississippi River, much of the need for the old trace was eliminated, and operation of Colbert's Ferry on the Tennessee was ended in 1819. Today, a modern bridge is available for travelers on the Natchez Trace Parkway. And now that you know a little about the Colbert brothers, let's get back to the original question about them and Stephen Colbert. Here are five things that you might consider as you form an opinion about a possible ancestral connection between Stephen Colbert and the Colbert family of northwest Alabama. Consideration number one is a simple fact. 
The spelling of the last name is the same in both cases, C-O-L-B-E-R-T. The second consideration seems to be undisputed. Stephen's father, James William, pronounces the family name as Colbert, while Stephen decided to call it Colbert when he started to college. Exactly how Levi and George said it isn't really known, but because the county that was named after the brothers is Colbert County, we might presume that is the way the brothers said it. Number three, Winona LaDuke is a Native American activist, and during an appearance on the Colbert Report, Stephen told her that he was one-thirteenth Chickasaw. Whether or not he was just joking is anyone's guess, but it is interesting that he picked Chickasaw rather than some other tribe. Devoting parts of three successive shows to a comedy skit about saving Tuscumbia, Alabama, was certainly influenced by it being the county seat of Colbert County. Perhaps that name coincidence was the entire reason, but it also might have been Stephen's way of paying a little homage to his distant kin. Number five. Again, perhaps it's just coincidence that both the Colberts and the Colberts hailed from the Palmetto State. Number six deserves some discussion. After acknowledging the difference in hairlines, there are some facial similarities between Stephen and Levi. The shape and size of the right ear. The peculiar arch of the right eyebrow. The size and shape of the eyes. The intense stare. The size and shape of the nose. The noticeably similar indentations above the top and below the bottom lips the slight dimple on the chin, the high cheekbones, and the slight bulge of the cheeks. What's the truth of the matter? I frankly admit I don't know, and I leave it up to you to form your own opinion. Of course, we can hope that Stephen Colbert himself steps in and gives us the facts. That could settle the issue once and for all. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. Until next time, just remember... I'm not Chuck.